Hello, everyone, and welcome to today's live webinar, Exosomes and Super Resolution Microscopy, presented by Dr. Ryan McNamara. I'm Susie Valdez of LabRoots, and I'll be your moderator for today's event. Today's educational web seminar is presented by LabRoots and brought to you by ONI. To learn more about our sponsor, please visit them at www.oni.bio. Now let's get started. Today's webinar is interactive. We encourage you to participate by submitting as many questions as you want at any time you want during the presentation. To do so, simply type them into the Ask a Question box and click Send. We'll answer as many questions as we have time for at the end of the presentation. If you have any trouble seeing or hearing this presentation, click on the Support tab found at the top right of your presentation window or use that Ask a Question box and let us know you're experiencing a problem. This presentation is educational and thus offers continuing education credits. Please click on the Continuing Education Credits tab and follow the process to obtain those credits. I now present today's speaker, Dr. Ryan McNamara, a research associate at the University of North Carolina at Chapel Hill. Dr. McNamara's research focuses on multiple facets of AIDS progression, from cellular infections with HIV to how can concurrent, concurrent infections and or malignancies affect HIV pathogenesis. Through investigations into these processes, we can increase our knowledge of basic cellular biology as well as identify pathways amenable to targeted therapies. Dr. McNamara, welcome. You may begin your presentation. Thank you very much, Susie, and thank you all for being here. For those watching this live, welcome, and for those watching this at a later date, uh, we will. this is an interactive session, and you can always ask me questions both now and at a later date, and we'll get back to that at the end of the presentation. So the title of my talk is Exosomes and Super Resolution Microscopy and a little bit of background about how I got into this field of exosomes is that I am actually a virologist, and my background is studying uh, numerous infectious diseases, and here are just a few of them. Uh, on the left, you have West Nile virus. This is a flavivirus. This is an RNA virus, and under negative staining through electron microscopy, it yields this very beautiful icosahedral particle. Next to it is herpes virus, which we will go into a lot throughout the remainder of this talk. Herpes virus also has a capsid, but it is surrounded by this very large cell-acquired membrane. Unlike West Nile virus, herpes virus's genomes are DNA. And you can really think of an exosome as a virus without a capsid. So exosomes transfer nucleic acids from one cell to the next, they have this very, um, a or very malleable cell-acquired membrane that can be taken from uh, the endosome, in the case of exosomes, or from the plasma membrane, in the case of microvesicles. And also, like viruses, they transport cargo from one cell to the next. So exosomes and their study present uh, a few caveats that we're going to be going through, and this is really the topic of this talk, so just a little bit of a rundown of an exosome. They typically have a hydrodynamic diameter of about 30 to 200 nanometers, um, although this can vary a little bit based off of their preparation method, and their size is estimated to be about 30 to 120 nanometers. And this is an electron microscope image that I took with a collaborator, Lindsay Costantini, over at North Carolina State University. And the diameter of these guys that you're seeing here are about 60 to 70 nanometers. Now, that diameter is below the achievable resolution of conventional light microscopy. And we will get into that a little bit later on. So as far as the biogenesis of an exosome, an exosome is a unique extracellular vesicle in that it originates from inside of the cell. And it originates from this body called the multivesicular body. 
the multivesicular body is a cluster of inwardly invaginated endosomes, which traffics to the plasma membrane and releases these exosomes as a cluster. Other cell, other cell released extracellular vesicles can include microvesicles, which directly bud off at the plasma membrane, very similar to how HIV is secreted. And another large class are apoptotic bodies, which are released when a cell is undergoing apoptosis. Exosomes are unique to these other classes of extracellular vesicles in that they originate from inside of the cell. So just to recap, exosomes originate from the early endosome. They merge into the multivesicular body through the inward invagination of those early endosomes, and they are secreted as a cluster. And so here what you're seeing is a, um, these are cells that stably express a CD63, which is a marker of an early endosome, tagged with uh, pH ulurum. And what you can see is that these guys, they light up, and what I really want you to focus on here is that they are predominantly localized inside of the cell, although you do see some eventually going towards the plasma membrane. These are the endosomes, which become exosomes that are secreted from the cell. So how do we see an exosome? Uh, exosomes present a number of problems for their study. Uh, through visualization, they present a very large problem in that they are actually below the limit of resolution of white light. So over on the left, you will see a rough schematic of an exosome. And the first thing that you're probably going to notice is that their diameter is less than 150 nanometers. They typically range anywhere from 40 to 120 nanometers in diameter. And they in, inside of an exosome are proteins, nucleic acids, such as microRNAs and other non-coding RNAs. And you, they are uniquely marked on their surface by proteins called tetraspanins. These tetraspanins can include CD63, CD81, CD9, CD45, and a few others. And we're going to go over those tetraspanins a lot throughout this talk. And again, I got into this field because an exosome has biophysical characteristics that are almost indistinguishable from viruses. They're of a similar size, they're of a similar density, and their role appears to be in the transfer of materials from one cell to the next. So on this slide, I'm going to show you all a short video of nanoparticle tracking and how we can visualize exosomes through this method. Okay, so what you're seeing here is a nanoparticle tracking analysis of the exosomes that we isolated using our isolation technique. What this is is dynamic light scattering in which a laser is pointing up into the exosomes and diffracting light, and those wobbling star-shaped objects are the exosomes, and how quickly they wobble can give us information on their size. Okay, so what we can visualize through nanoparticle tracking analysis are really three independent attributes about the particles viewed, and that is their size distribution. So for example, here's a size distribution analysis using a nanoparticle tracking analysis in which you can see that exosomes have a quite narrow peak as far as size distribution. Other extracellular vesicles, such as microvesicles, typically are a little bit larger as are apoptotic bodies. And BJAB and BCBL1, these are just two different cell lines that we frequently employ. And this is just to show you that regardless of source, the exosomes appear to be of the same diameter. From the nanoparticle tracking analysis, you also get mean and mode sizes through the Brownian motion. And lastly, you can also get concentration measurements. So the purpose, or one of my goals, is to develop a tractable system 
for exosomes to monitor functional consequence. And I'm going to propose doing this through three uh, independent steps. One is a robust isolation pipeline in which we can isolate uh, a concentrated preparation of homogeneous and functional exosomes. So for example, here is a preparation of exosomes viewed by negative staining uh, electron microscopy. The second step is to produce a tractable system to follow delivered exosomes, and that is to be able to identify which cells and organs can uptake the exosomes and where are they trafficked. And this can then be viewed via super resolution microscopy. And the last step is to have a functional readout. And this is very important for us, virologists, is to have a known response by recipient cells to exosomes so that we can ask, did the delivered exosomes retain functionality? And so what I'm showing over here are cells treated with HD exosomes, HD just stands for healthy donor, and exosomes taken from KSHV, this is Kaposi sarcoma herpes virus. Uh, this is um, the cells infected with KSHV, taking the exosomes from them and delivering them to recipient cells and asking, do we have a unique phenotype? So to go over a robust isolation pipeline, how we isolate exosomes is through cross-flow filtration. And we couple that with a high molecular weight chromatography, and this allows us to isolate exosomes from leaders of input solution. So really briefly, to go over cross-flow filtration, what you have is an input fluid that is put into your cross-flow chamber, there in pink. Through peristolic pump, it is pumped ultimately into, across a molecular weight cutoff filter. Things larger than the molecular weight cutoff filter, ultimately return to the cross-flow chamber. Things that are smaller than the molecular weight cutoff are lost to the permeate. And this occurs over the course of several hours, and it, you, it allows you to concentrate your solution, in our case, exosomes, while simultaneously equilibrating them with an equilibration buffer. Once we have our concentrated solution, we put these through a high molecular weight chromatography system. Uh, we prefer to use CaptaCore, and what you can see is that we are able to isolate a discrete pool, we call this our extracellular vesicle pool, that has high acetylcholine esterase activity, a high concentration of particles per mil, and also a very unique and identifiable protein uh, band as judged by Silverstein. When you mount these onto grids and measure them manually via electron microscopy, when you use capto or when you use crossflow filtration followed by a captacore step, we're able to get a very nice homogeneous peak of exosomes. And this is that difference to other methods such as ultracentrifugation, which really puts puts a lot of physical stress on the exosomes and can lead to slightly larger shifts in sizes. So the next step that we wanted to do is develop a tractable system to follow delivered exosomes. So real briefly, going back to what is an exosome, uh, exosomes are marked on their surface by these tetraspanins, CD63, CD81, and CD9. And we can take advantage of that to couple those, pro those proteins to fluorescent transgenes such as GFP and M. cherry. So what you're looking at here is a super resolution image of a cell co-expressing CD63 GFP and CD81 M. cherry. And I'm going to zoom in on a small box highlighted there in yellow on the far right on our merge panel. And what you're going to see is a very beautiful overlay most of the time of these two proteins. What you're looking at here are most likely late endosomes or multivesicular body clusters 
of these proteins. So this is looking at the maturing exosome inside of a cell via super resolution microscopy. CD63 and CD81 are part of the same complex, the exosome, or in this case, the late endosome or multivesicular body. And just as a control, we want to overlay CD81 with actin via super resolution microscopy and just ensure that what we are having is a nice overlay that we can do function or that we can do statistics on. And as you can see, when we zoom in, there in yellow, another box I highlighted on the far right, you can see that we have a nice, beautiful actin filament there. In this case, the actin is stained with phalloidin 488. Uh, I'm sorry, Alexaflor 488. And what you can see is that CD81 in cherry does not really co-localize with actin filaments. So that's inside the cell. Outside of the cell, we typically like to isolate exosomes using antibody-coated beads. In this case, this is another super-resolution image of exosomes conjugated to um, an antibody-coded bead, in this case, anti-CD81. And these are exosomes from our cell that produce CD63 GFP and CD81 M cherry. In blue is CD63. We false color these uh, just for our um, for the colorblind audience. We don't want to do any red green overlays here. So we false colored CD63 in blue, and CD81 is there in red. And this is what we typically see on antibody coated beads, and that is that the exosomes tend to cluster onto these beads. However, sometimes you get really lucky and you can identify what appears to be a single exosome on a beat. And through a uh, collaboration that we, that we are working on with the University of North Carolina Department of Astronomy, we are trying to model um, images such as this to identify, could this be a single exosome? And since CD63 and CD81 are on the cell surface, what we can do is we can essentially draw a sphere around the perimeter in which only the fluorescence intensity is around the perimeter of a sphere. And in this case, that sphere, um, the diameter is about 82 nanometers in solution, and this is the expected size of an exosome. So this is a very tricky setup for super resolution microscopy. A lot of people prefer photo switching fluorophores such as alexafluors. We chose to do this using um, conjugated proteins because we wanted to be able to see exactly with very discrete definition where our signal was coming from. And if possible, could we actually do something like this where we are looking only at the perimeter of, of an exosome? So a validation method, uh, instead of this, approach in which you're using uh, conjugated proteins, and this is most likely a much easier method to do, is an indirect labeling of the exosomes using antibodies. In this case, you can have an anti-CD63 conjugated to an alexafluor 555 or an anti-CD81 conjugated to an alexafluor 647. And you can do both of these at the same time. And when you do that, you typically see something like this, in which you're able to really see the entire definition of an exosome. So here in orange is CD63, CD81 is colored in blue. And when you draw a straight line through the image, and again, this is through super resolution microscopy, you can see that these two tetraspanins are sitting on an exosome and oftentimes in very close proximity towards each other. And if you're very talented at this procedure, then you'll be able to draw essentially the entire perimeter of a cell or the entire perimeter of an exosome and measure the diameter from one end to the next. And this is um, done with uh, alexafluor conjugated antibodies, which allows for more definition. As you can see, there's more signal, particularly on that image to the right 
you can see that there's a lot of events there, and this is a distinct advantage to using Alexa for conjugated antibodies as opposed to direct conjugation of CD63 or CD81 with fluorescent proteins. So going back to our system, we have our CD81 conjugated to an M cherry. So if we have a cell pellet and an exosome pellet, we would expect that M cherry to be carried over into our exosome pellet. And so here's just a protein blot showing markers of an exosome that are tetraspanins, part of the escort machinery. This is the endosomal recycling complex, as well as flotillin-2, which is a lipid wrapped protein. And as you can see, those proteins are enriched in our exosome pellet, whereas beta-actin is enriched primarily in our cell pellet. The sources for these are either wild-type or CD81 M-cherry expressing cells. Now, when we isolate the exosome pellet from the cells, what you can see is that the exosome pellet from our CD81 M-cherry expressing cells is vividly red, whereas the exosome pellet from our wild-type cells is mostly opaque, kind of gives a, um, almost a yellowish hue. So the next step after isolation is that we want to know, could, can these exosomes be uptaken by cells? In this case, what we did is we incubated primary peripheral blood mononuclear cells, or PBMCs, with exosomes taken either from our wild-type cells or from our CD1, CD81 M cherry cells. As a positive control, we have our wild-type uh, exosomes labeled with an organic dye, DII. This artificially turns the exosomes red. And as you can see here via, via flow cytometry, we are able to transfer these CD81 M cherry exosomes into our primary cells. We next wanted to know where these, uh, where these exosomes go. So this is a super resolution image of endothelial cells treated either with wild type exosomes or exosomes isolated from our CD81 M cherry producer cells. And so as you can see in our M cherry channel, this is excited with a 562 nanometer laser. We do not get any signal above background. However, when we treat cells with our CD81 M cherry exosomes, you get this very speckly appearance. So zooming in on that yellow box on the right, you can see that these exosomes go into these relatively punctate structures upon uh, bringing them in by an endothelial cell. Now a caveat to this approach is that this is actually looking at CD81 M cherry. We cannot conclude from this image that the exosomes themselves are intact. This may very well be unloaded protein from the delivered exosomes. Notwithstanding, what we have shown is that you can deliver labeled exosomes either with an organic dye such as DII or directly conjugated such as CD81 M cherry exosomes and see them via super resolution microscopy. So the last thing that we want is to have a functional readout. And this is very important to us as virologists. So well, the emerging picture of exosomes is that they prime an environment. They, are very, they act very locally to maintain local homeostasis. And it has been shown that a number of viruses have usurped this pathway to incorporate factors into exosomes factors such as microRNAs or virally encoded proteins. In the case of Kaposi sarcoma herpes virus, or KSHV, KSHV is able to incorporate a number of microRNAs into exosomes. And we wanted to know if these KSHV exosomes were capable of exerting a unique phenotype on recipient cells. So what we did is we treated endothelial cells, which are the target of transformation by KSHV, 
with exosomes isolated either from control cells or from KSHV infected cells. And these are affinity purified so that we are not actually adding on any infectious virus onto these cells. We are only interested in what happens when we add exosomes onto these cells. So we did a chronic exposure to, uh, we did a chronic exposure of endothelial cells with these exosomes, and we took out RNA for RNA-seq at different time points. We did this experiment all the way up to 12 days, and we divided this up into the time points of acute, intermediate, and chronic. And what you're seeing here is an RNA-seq of significantly altered genes of cells treated either with control exosomes or KSHV exosomes. We identified somewhere around 300 significantly altered genes that were the result of chronic treatment with exosomes taken from KSHV infected cells. So that's on the nucleic acid and transcriptional side. What about just the physiological side? So here are endothelial cells viewed through H&E staining that were treated either with mock, with control exosomes, with KSHV exosomes, or just looking at endothelial cells chronically infected with KSHV. And what you can see in panel C is an enhanced swarming of the endothelial cells when exposed to KSHV exosomes. This is further confirmed through activation of the cell proliferation marker, KI67. So on top, our cells, our endothelial cells, treated with exosomes from a healthy donor. And on the bottom, our cells treated with exosomes coming from KSHV. And what you can see here is activation of the cell proliferation marker, KI67. So hopefully I've convinced you that we have developed a tractable system to view the functional consequence of exosomes. So the remaining questions that we have that can be greatly facilitated through super-resolution microscopy are what specific contents of exosomes contribute to discrete phenotypes. So recall that exosomes incorporate microRNAs, they incorporate proteins, they also incorporate some other things. However, an exosome is beneath the limit of resolution of white light. So therefore, identifying factors inside of an exosome can really only be done using super-resolution microscopy if you want to be able to tease it apart from one specific exosome to, to the next. So we, in our case, as virologists, we want to understand what is it about these exosomes that is exerting such a unique phenotype, such as the swarming of these endothelial cells or their transcriptional reprogramming. Another remaining question that we have is how are uptake and contents sorted? So this is the endothelial cell treated with exosomes that are expressing or that have CD81M cherry on their surface. As you can see, the exosomes go into fairly discrete punctate structures, or at least the CD81M cherry does. We're not sure if this is still an intact exosome or if this is protein being unloaded. We also do not know what these specific compartments are. And through the use of super-resolution microscopy, we're able to get down to nanometer-based resolution to identify what these compartments are. Is this the lysosome? Is this the late endosome? Is this the autophagosome? Those answers are very, or those are very difficult questions to answer through conventional microscopy. And that is something that super resolution microscopy can really facilitate our learning. In. Another remaining question is actually going back to the production of exosomes. So this is our cell, these are our producer cells, which express CD63GFP and CD81M cherry. 
And as you can see, I'm zooming in on that little square on the right. And hopefully what you can see is that while CD63 GFT and CD81 M Cherry do have several regions where they co-localize, CD81 M Cherry tends to have a little bit more globular clustering. And this can actually be quantitated over here on the left as a frequency, as a cluster length and frequency analysis. And so as you can see, CD81 has more cluster lengths. CD63 tends to be in a little bit more discrete localizations. This is also confirmed by just viewing endogenous CD63 and CD81 as well. When you look at either CD81 and Cherry or endogenous CD81, you see CD81 going into more of these clustular domains, whereas CD63 tends to be a little bit more discrete, although they do overlap like treatment. Also, we also kind of want to understand the tracking of exosomes in recipient cells. So what you're seeing there, and yes, what you're seeing there are these little guys going into a cell. Now, we are not entirely sure if the exosome is uptaken as a whole or if it fuses with the plasma membrane. Different groups have different perspectives on this, and I, I don't really want to get too much into that. But this is another thing that super resolution can really facilitate our understanding it, is not only how are exosomes taken up, but where are their contents trafficked to, and how are their, con and how are their contacts contents recycled through the recipient cell. And from that previous um, slide that I showed you, you can actually view how these things are uptaken. And this is a uh, diffusion coefficient graph from the previous, uh, fr from the previous cell that I showed you, in which case the contents that are going into the cell can be tracked using super resolution microscopy, and you can really start to see where these things are going. Now, the individual compartments, we're still working on that, and this is something that we're actually working with the ONI people on. Uh, it's a very, it's, it's quite a difficult question to answer, but using super resolution, we actually think that we can answer, this is a very answerable question. And with that, I'll go ahead and wrap up and we can start taking questions. I want to thank people at the University of North Carolina at Chapel Hill, particularly Dirk Dentmoon, Blossom Demania, and Jack Griffith. We have collaborators at the Tulane National Primate Research Center for our MACAC studies. I also want to thank Dr. Lindsay Costantini at North Carolina Central University. She is uh, my collaborator for electron microscopy imaging. We also want to thank the good folks at Oxford Nano Imaging who uh, were able to look at our data, refine it a little bit, give me some of the, the clustering analysis, and we're still working with them. And the funding agencies that I'm supported by are the National Institute of Health, as well as the AIDS Malignancy Consortium. And with that, I will conclude. And thank you all for your attention. And we have a lot of questions to get to. Uh, but thank you very much for hosting me. And thank you so much, Dr. McNamara, for your informative presentation. We will now start the live Q&A portion of this webinar. And if you have any questions you'd like to ask, please do so now. Just click on that Ask a Question box located on the far left of your screen, and we'll answer as many questions as we have time for. So let's get started. As Dr. McNamara said, we have a lot of questions already coming in. Thank you, audience members. Our first question, Dr. McNamara, is, from which tissue have you isolated the exosomes? So from which tissue have we isolated the exosomes? We have taken these from cell lines that are maintained in the lab, and these are very common cell lines, such as 293 cells, uh, Vero cells. Uh, we take them, in our case, for, from a virology perspective, we take them from lymphocytes, 
These are, can either be cultured or primary derived. Uh, and our isolation protocol also allows us to take exosomes from primary fluids, such as plasma, such as urine. Um, and we've also even isolated exosomes from cerebral spinal fluid, although those volumes are actually quite low. Um, the, the exosomes are, are rich in so many, so many fluids, whether it's tissue culture or body fluids. Um, we stay in the eukaryotic system uh, and multicellular organism system. Uh, there's other researchers who do this um, kind of on, on helminths and even on bacteria. We prefer to stick um, in uh, higher eukaryotic systems. Thank you. And what is the initial volume required to isolate these numbers of exosomes? And which is the source? Cells in culture. Okay, so that red pellet that I showed earlier in the presentation, that was taken from osteosarcoma cells that were stably expressing CD81M cherry. This is actually a clonally expanded cell that we isolated via flow sorting. And the exosome pellet from that cell, or the exosome pellet from those cells was taken from a liter of cells. And this is an advantage that we think that we have to using tangential flow filtration or cross-flow filtration, is that as you can use industrial scale volumes. Now, when you're talking about things like human plasma, it's a little bit more of a dense fluid. And we usually don't work with upwards of a liter of human plasma. We, we normally work in the range of something like 40 to 100 milliliters of human plasma. And this is processed uh, by removing the erythrocytes and the leukocytes. Uh, we just want that, that plasma-rich layer. And you can isolate the exosomes from that either by tangential flow or by affinity purification. So things like cerebral spinal fluid, you're only going to get a couple drops of. We typically use um, antibody-coated beads directly to get those. Thank you. And Dr. McNamara, can the cross-flow filtration purification method avoid the membrane debris with similar size as exosome during the purification? Can cross-flow filtration, so I, I assume that some of the, the membrane debris that's being referred to here uh, might be things such as LDLs or HDLs, um, some kind of other lipoproteins or maybe even microvesicles. The cross-flow filtration part is really meant to concentrate down your solution, uh, selecting for large macromolecules. So we have a molecular weight cutoff filter of $750,000. So this is going to remove a lot of secreted lipid moieties, um, uh, as well as kind of contaminating debris. And you can change the size of the pores on your cross-flow filtration setup. Now, other things such as viruses and microvesicles you cannot, this, you cannot separate those through this method using cross-flow filtration because the properties of a microvesicle, a virus, an exosome, they're very similar as far as molecular weight. And really to tease apart those, you need uh, an additional step. We use antibody-coated beads. Other people, um, they often use density gradients. They use sucrose gradients, iodixinol gradients. There needs to be a subsequent step in order to really uh, tease apart those, those complexes. Thank you for that. And are CD63, CD9, CD81, and CD45 ubiquitous markers on the exosome? Oh, oh boy. Uh, you're going to get me in trouble answering this one. <laughs> uh, CD60, these tetraspanins, um, the current model is that these tetraspanins are on the surface of 
vesicles that we term exosomes. Okay, uh, that view is actually uh, evolving, per maybe a little bit. I think what some people may have seen on my super resolution imaging was that CD63 and CD81, they're not always together. In fact, uh, one thing that we have seen, and this has actually been uh, confirmed through some of our collaborators and some other, uh, some other laboratories throughout the United States and throughout the world, is that CD81 and CD9 can actually localize to the inner leaflet of the plasma membrane. So if, in that case, if they bought off straight from there, they would be classified as a microvesicle. Uh, this is, again, something that we're really interested in employing super resolution for because you can really get down to the nanometer level of resolution to see, okay, where is this vesicle coming from? Um, now, as far as being ubiquitous markers on exosomes across cell types, uh, these tetraspanins do seem to be fairly well expressed across a number of cell lines, across a number of tissues from the body. Uh, some tend to be a little bit more enriched coming from a certain tissue than another. But for the most part, they seem to be present on these exosomes coming from uh, a number of different cell types. Thank you so much. And again, thank you, audience members, for these great questions coming in. Dr. McNamara, how, to, how do you purify the labeled exosome after labeling the exosome with dill dye? Are you removing floating dye? So that is a great question. And we actually filter out the dye using the Capticor resin. So what we have is kind of a slurry. Of, of exosomes and dye? And this is a great question. Uh, what you have is a, a slurry of exosome and dye, but a lot of that dye is not incorporated. So if you're going to treat cells with labeled exosomes, you want to be sure that the punctate structures that you're looking at are because of the exosomes and not from uh, unincorporated dye. So we incubate the exosomes, in this case, uh, with the DII dye. We incubate the exosomes with that, and then we passage that through a Capticor column. And we use Capticor resin um, specifically because it was designed to purify viruses. Uh, Capticor resin was meant to remove chicken albumin, actually, going back a little bit in time. It was meant to remove chicken albumin from uh, from flu production for, for vaccinations because of poultry allergies. And the Capricorn has a very high molecular weight cutoff. I believe that the one we, I believe it's 700 kilodons. And what, it, what it's able to, to do is really capture um, and retain things that are, that are not of that uh, molecular weight cutoff. And as you're passing this through your, your column, you'll easily be able to see uh, your exosomes traveling through this column with the DII dye. And to regenerate the column, we just use uh, sodium hydroxide. And what you see is that the um, unincorporated dye takes a while to elute off from these columns. So we really do believe that through, our, um, through that protocol, we're really only labeling our exosomes. There's an alternative way of doing this, which we also do, and that is adding in the dye and then doing an antibody bead capture of the exosomes. So in this case, uh, the exosomes are immobilized on the beads and uh, excess dye is just washed away through whatever wash buffer that you're using. So uh, yet, yes, we are, we are trying uh, very hard to ensure that unincorporated dye is not contaminating our final prep? That's a very good question. Thank you. And are these exosomes expressing labeled CD81 or CD63? And this is a two-part question. If so, then how do you assess the functional readout of W 
um, T exosomes on the recipient cells using the methodology? Okay, so the, I'll take that first part. Are these exosomes expressing labeled CD81 or CD63? Um, the answer is yes and no and both. So sometimes it's just the CD81 that's labeled with M cherry. Sometimes it's only the CD63 that's labeled with GFP, and sometimes we use we use both of them. So we have we have clonally expanded uh, flow sorted cells that are expressing CD81, M cherry, CD63, GFP, or a combination of the two. Um, and we kind of set up our controls using that system. So, you know, we're dealing, we're dealing with uh, two fluorophores here, uh, and GFP and, and M cherry, so that we can really allow ourselves to do three colors through storm microscopy. Uh, we have, on our, on our storm, we have a 400 nanometer laser, a 488 nanometer laser, a 562 nanometer laser, and a 647 nanometer laser. The GFP, or the CD63 GFP is going to take up the 488, the CD81 M cherry is going to take up the 562, and that leaves us with, with two more channels that we can still do super resolution with. Uh, so the, the answer is, is really all of the above. We want to be sure that we're doing all of our controls properly. Um, so if so, how do you assess the functional readout of wild type exosomes on recipient cells using the methodology. So we're using the CD81 M cherry or CD63 GFP or the combination to build our system up. The, the wild type exosomes is really just a comparison in, in order to, um, uh, to, to ensure that our exosomes are labeled. Uh, so moving forward, we're going into the fluorescence system. So we want to be able to track our exosomes using the CD81M cherry or CD63GFP. The wild type exosomes is really a negative control, and we're not terribly concerned about the functional readout of, of per se, just the wild type alone, because we're labeling these exosomes um, de novo. We're labeling them inside the cell so that we can track them. And I hope that makes sense. Thank you for that. <clears throat> and are the miRNA the major cargo? And did you check the mRNA in the exosomes? Um, and actually, there's one more part of this question. Is the mRNA, is it functional or just fragment without function in the exosomes? Okay. All right. So we'll take the first one. Is the microRNA the major cargo of an exosome? Um, not really. Uh, they, they do constitute a large uh, subset of cargo, uh, but microRNAs just fall under the broader umbrella of nucleic acids. And other groups have shown that non-coding RNAs, um, some mRNAs can get in there, some S, SNO RNAs can be pushed into exosomes. So microRNAs are just one of, of many things transferred. Uh, via exosomes. So did we check the mRNA in the exosome uh, a little bit? We didn't find too much mRNA in the exosome. Uh, for our purposes, especially in the virology-based approach, we were mostly focused on microRNAs since they are incorporated into exosomes at very high rates, much higher than mRNAs. So then the final question, mRNA, is that functional or is it just a short fragment without function in exosomes? Uh, for this question, I think the best example we have from a virologist is there, there's a group that has reported that hepatitis C virus can incorporate the full-length mRNA of hepatitis C into an exosome and transfer that to a non-infected cell, and the mRNA is, is functional in that case. Um, in our case, we don't really find KSHV or other herpes virus mRNAs in our exosomes, um, so we don't really have a, 
a functional readout for them because we don't we don't really detect mRNAs in in our system. But again, our system is unique even to that other system of, of hepatitis C. Thank you so much. And are there any known receptors of exosome? Oh, wow. That's, that's I mean, that's the million-dollar question. Um, so exosomes, we think of, or I think of them as viruses without a capsid. And viruses are very specific in what kind of cell that they infect. So HIV, for example, goes into T lymphocytes or macrophages via binding to CD4, CXCR4, and CCR5. So these are very receptor-dependent uh, uptake of the virus. Exosomes appear to be able to be uptaken by just about any cell that that you isolate, whether they're lymphocytes, endothelial cells, uh, macrophages, cardiac cells, uh, hepatic cells. Yeah, so it, is there a receptor for exosomes? Um, I mean, that, that's a great question because if there is a receptor for exosomes, it would appear to be fairly ubiquitously expressed across very different cells. And so in that case, um, that, that's, that's, that's pretty much beyond my realm of expertise because I'm a little bit more, as a virologist, you know, we're, 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 I guess when you're good with a hammer, the world looks like a nail. So I, I look for very specific receptors of a virus. Uh, so, yeah, again, hepatitis C only goes into uh, liver cells. Exosomes can go really anywhere they want. Uh, so it, it, it's very interesting to think about. I am, I do not think that the field has come to a consensus on a bona fide exosome receptor. Um, yeah, that, that, is, that is a very good question, and hopefully that is a, a good answer. <laughs> because some people might really disagree with me on that one. I'm trying to be as safe as possible. <laughs> Thank you so much, Dr. McNamara. And these are such great questions coming in. Our audience is fabulous today. Is the nanoparticle tracking analysis for measuring size published somewhere? And what form of super resolution microscopy? <laughs> And I can I never say that word. Um, my microscopy. Uh, what was it used? So, is the nanoparticle tracking analysis for measuring size published somewhere? The nanoparticle tracking analysis is based off of dynamic light scattering, and this has actually been around for quite a while. And it was just what they were able to do is really bump up the sensitivity for these things for these nanoparticle tracking um, machines in order to see exosomes. So exosomes do not really diffract a lot of light. So they're very difficult to see through other methods such as flow cytometry. Other people can see them via flow cytometry, uh, but to do that, you have to have a very specialized flow cytometer. Uh, nanoparticle tracking uh, has, been, it, it has been around for a while. And really what it's doing is it's just measuring the Brownian motion of particles and how quickly they're wobbling around. And based off of how quickly they're wobbling around, it's able to, to judge the size of a particle based off its wobbling properties. Um, and the second question is, what form of super resolution microscopy was used in this talk? Uh, this was uh, D-Storm. I understand that this was, and this is uh, a little bit tricky here. So typically people who do D-Storm, uh, this is with fixed samples, and they're doing this with Alexaflor or dilite conjugated antibodies. Um, we do these with directly protein conjugated uh, fluorescent proteins, and we do it also in a combination. So the actin super-resolution microscopy images that I was showing 
That was with uh, phalloidin conjugated to Alexa 488. We do this with you know, other phalloidins such as Alexa 4647, Alexa 4555. Uh, the setup is fairly similar from, from a technical standpoint. Um, however, the, the proteins do not photo switch as well as Alexa floors or dialytes. And that is something that um, the, um, the people at LNI have really wanted me to, to stress, particularly in this talk, and that is viewing GFP and MCherry by super resolution is not, it's, it's not easy. You need to have cells that express a lot of these things, which is actually why we did uh, flow sorting. We not only wanted positive cells, we wanted bright positive cells. We wanted uh, cells that were expressing a ton of CD63 GFP and CD81 M cherry. We have a couple other cell lines. Um, we also have CD9 M cherry. We wanted those cells to be very bright, uh, just because the, um, the the physical properties of M cherry and GFP, as far as photo switching goes for for D-storm, they're not anywhere near as optimal as those as that of Alexafor uh, conjugated antibodies or Alexafor conjugated phalloidins. So the protocol is the same, mostly, uh, but the sensitivity range is is very different, and um, yeah, I, I would kind of defer a little bit more on the biophysics of that to to the ONI people who um, I, I work with and we have a lot of conference calls together on how we can optimize op, you know, kind of optimize how we're setting this up because it, it actually is quite difficult. Thank you. And in your experience, what is the best whole exosome labeling protocol is it uh, DID or NHS reactive dyes in sodium bicarbonate pH and uh, it says pH 8 buffer? Yes. So in this case, when you're labeling exosomes with an organic dye, um, and this question brings up uh, the DI series of dyes, DID, D and there's other ones such as DII, DIO. Um, we have... And, and I've even brainstormed this one with the, the ONIC people. Uh, through the nano imager, we do not have a lot of luck with the DI series of, of labels. Do they work? Yes. You can get them to photo switch. They don't photo switch a lot, and you're not able to get a lot of resolution. You're not able to get some of those, some of those images I was showing earlier of a single exosome. Uh, in that case, those were labeled with um, uh, CD63 and CD81. Uh, I think it's, yeah, it was, it, it's, it's very difficult to do those with the DI series. So um, talking with Rafael and Kaja over at, over at Oxford Nano Imaging, they pointed me towards this series of dyes called cell mask dyes. And the cell mass dyes, uh, there's, there's two of them that we use, cell mass green and cell mask red. The cell mask red is a far red dye, and it shows up fairly well on our 647 nanometer excitation laser. And the cell mask green shows up fairly well on the 488 excitation laser. Um, again, it's, it's not the best. Uh, your samples will, will photo bleach fairly quickly, and you're not going to get too many photo switching events. Uh, but people are are people are doing this, and they're doing it um, incredibly well. There's a couple of groups who who do this really well. Um, we've, for the most part, moved away from the DI series of dyes for super resolution microscopy, and we've moved more into the cell mass. Uh, but even still, in those, you're going to have some problems because they're they're really tricky um, to, um, to 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 work with. Uh, more protocols are being developed to uh, to get single exosome 
resolution off of the nano imager, uh, the DI series just seemed to be a little suboptimal. Thank you. And did you do um, sucrose gradient UC? So sucrose gradient uh, for ultracentrifugation is a great way to kind of cushion your your exosomes as they're being put on an ultracentrifugation tube. Uh, we prefer to do um, antibody-based selection of exosomes as opposed to sucrose-based selection of exosomes because we really want to ensure that the viruses and the exosomes are separate from each other. As far as densities go, the density of an exosome and a microvesicle and a virus are pretty similar. You can separate them off of very carefully prepared sucrose or iodixinol gradients, uh, but we, we prefer not to risk that. We just go straight towards antibody based capture of exosomes so that we can be fairly certain that we're not contaminating uh, with, with viral particles. Thank you, Dr. McNamara. And our next audience member wants to know, what do you mean by hydrodynamic diameter and how does it influence the exosomes analysis? Okay, so the hydrodynamic diameter of an exosome, uh, kind of what we're referring to here is just what exosomes are in solution. So if you could shrink down to you know, 30 nanometers in size and just swim throughout plasma, how big do exosomes look in their, in their native state? So we, um, when we mount these for transmission electron microscopy, the protocol that we use dehydrates them a little bit. And because of that, they're going to be shrunk down in size a little bit more than what they would be um, in their in their native state, so that's what I was was trying to get at. Um, and, and, and how does uh, uh, and how does it influence the uh, the exosome analysis? And, and that's kind of that as part of one of the reasons it influences how you analyze these things is um, how are they prepared? So if you're looking at these via electron microscopy, our method dehydrates them a little bit. Uh, if you're looking at them through nanoparticle tracking analysis. They're in solution, um, so they're a little bit more in their, their native and their happy state. But through nanoparticle tracking analysis, what you're really looking at is diffracted light. You're looking at scattered light. So it's kind of more of an indirect measurement because you're using the scattered light to see how quickly they're wobbling around. And then you calculate their diameter based off of the Brownian motion of how quickly they're wobbling around. Every method of quantifying exosomes and microvesicles and these other extracellular vesicles, every method has its own pros and cons. And it's just a matter of, of you know, doing whatever you can with the tools available to you. Thank you for that. And our next question is a two-part question. Is your exosome isolation protocol similar to tangential flow filtration, and do we need sophisticated equipment to set up um, an isolation protocol in a lab? So, um, really appreciate this question. Uh, I use the terms tangential flow filtration and cross flow filtration interchangeably for, for, for this talk. So, the answer to the first part is yes. Is our protocol similar to tangential flow filtration? It is because um, it is tangential flow filtration, at least the first step. Uh, the second step that we do is we generally try to concentrate that down even further. Um, we can also put it over chromatography based resins, especially when we're labeling them with dyes. Uh, so, yes, tangential flow filtration we use because we want to start off with industrial grade volume. Uh, in our case, when we're getting that bright red exosome pellet from our CD81M cherry producing cells, we're starting with a liter of a cell of supernate. And not many 
uh, not many isolation techniques can really isolate something from a leader without a, an initial concentration step. And that's why we do tangential flow. Uh, so the second part, do you need sophisticated equipment to set up the isolation protocol in the lab? Well, the first thing that, that you need is a tangential flow uh, filtration operator. Uh, in our case, we have a reservoir tank that can hold up, up to a liter of input solution. Um, and then you have to go through, okay, what is the best filter yeah, for your system? Uh, for us, we use a 750 kilodalton filter. Uh, I've seen other groups use uh, 300 kilodalton filters. Uh, and I, I'm sure that there's some other groups out there who, who play around with the, um, the filter size on that. And you also need to play around with how much pressure you're putting on the exosomes, your flow rates. Um, I, we do have a, um, a manuscript that we published, I think it was in November of last year, that kind of goes into it a little bit more detailed, um, including the specific instrument that we're using. Uh, so the answer is, yes, there is a startup cost for this isolation protocol, but it really allows you to uh, get exosomes to a very concentrated solution so that you can really perform in vivo experiments uh, at physiological relevant concentrations of exosomes while retaining their function. Thank you so much. And did you use the Nikon buffer to cause blinking of the GFP and M cherry? Okay, so for the, the blinking of GFP and M cherry, uh, this is a, a great question. Uh, we use the B cubed solution from uh, Oxford Nano Imaging. And we have continued to use this for, for years now. Uh, I mean, we've known the, we, we've known the ONI people for, for years now. And uh, we, we weren't sure how well, that how well that buffer was going to work for our system until I believe they came and we, we demoed the instrument. And as it turns out, it actually works very good, especially for GFP. M Cherry is a little bit more of a kind of a stickler. It's a little bit more difficult. GFP seems to photo switch a lot better than M Cherry. It, it's difficult to say if that's a property of the floor floor, of the, uh, of the buffer, of the stability of the protein itself, of the abundance of the protein itself. And there's a lot of variables to account for there. But for our, for our purposes, the BQ solution works, works very well in our system for both fluorescent proteins as well as Alexa Flores and, uh, and the dye lights. Thank you so much. And um, I thank you, audience members. These are just great questions coming in today. Have you tried to label non-tetraspanin fluorescently to image exosomes? Oh, um, so we did label, okay. So we, we have labeled TSG-101 with an M-cherry. Uh, we got fairly similar results, um, and that is with a fluorescent protein. But also importantly, we also just look at the endogenous genes of these. We look at unlabeled CD63, um, unlabeled CD81, and we do this just with, um, with antibodies, and those antibodies conjugated to, to Alexa fluoros. The results are fairly similar. You see some things enriched a little bit more in the cytoplasm, in the, uh, uh, in the early endosome. You see some things a little bit more enriched into globular domains. Uh, CD81 tends to go into a little bit more globular domains. So does the, the protein ALIX, at least in our hands. So the answer is, is yes, we, we have gone back and forth. Uh, the purpose really of going into the GFP and the M-Cherry system is that we wanted to be able to view the exosomes from production inside the cell to purification outside the cell and to subsequent delivery and to identify what compartments they're going into. And for our, for our research, the tetrastanins seem to work the best 
Um, although it, it's difficult for me to, to answer that because we haven't really invested so much time and energy into looking at at a lot of these other genes. Um, we know that a couple other groups are, are actually doing that right now, and they they just they have a, they have more people working on it than than what we do. So I'll, I'm not going to step on their toes. Thank you. And um, are exosomes too large to pass through the ion channels? Uh, well, it it kind of depends on what kind of channel that uh, you're talking about here. Um, if if we're talking about um, neuronal cells, um, there's a great group at the University of Chicago that is working on this right now. And, or no, he's at Northwestern. Uh, and his name is escaping me right now, but I, he's, a really, he's a really good guy. I, I've talked to him at several meetings. And they're really focused on distinguishing exosomes from these other things spat out at, um, at neuronal junctions. Are, are they discrete um, vesicular bodies? Do they originate from, from the same pathway? Are they uptaken in the same pathway? And, uh, you know, my, I just, a lot of that is so preliminary uh, and it is a little bit more tailored towards the, the neuroscience field uh, that I just I don't feel very qualified to answer that question because that is that's a very good question and uh, neuroscience is, is and that's a pretty tough that's a pretty tough field thank you so much and our our next audience member says first of all very interesting talk and he wants to know how much do you typically get the exosome particles per lit liter of cell culture, and what about per um, ml of plasma? All right, great question. Um, uh, that okay, we find typically that the exosome concentration in plasma is higher than that from cell culture superpaint. So we typically don't need to use as much plasma as cell culture superpaint. Now, when we take it from a liter of cell culture supernatant, um, sometimes we even work with a little bit more, we're looking for um, a final concentration after all of our steps. We're looking for a final concentration of about 10 to the 13 to 10 to the 14 particles per milliliter. And our volumes are typically, we, we bring it down to about, uh, I would say about 300 to 500 microliters. So yes, we're, we're taking the exosomes from a liter and we're bringing it down to half of a mil. So it is a very long concentration step. This is through tangential flow, followed by um, either precipitation with polyethylene glycol. Uh, you can also do this uh, with more affinity capture methods. Uh, so that is a total particles per milliliter. Now, not all those particles are exosomes. Uh, you have a lot of other extracellular vesicles that aren't classified as exosomes. Uh, so from that solution that we have about 10 to the 13 to 10 to the 14 particles per mil, we can do an antibody capture on, on magnetic beads or protein A beads, and we, we typically get somewhere around, I guess it kind of depends on the source, anywhere from uh, 10 to the 10 to 10 to the 11. We're almost always saturating our beads at that point. Um, so it's hard to get a concentration much higher than that specifically of exosomes uh, because we're doing an antibody-mediated capture and illusion. Uh, but that is a, uh, that's, that's a great question, and it does kind of show that there's a big difference between working with cell culture and working with plasma that you, and, and other primary fluids. At the primary fluids, you have exosomes in, in your plasma that originated from cardiomyocytes, you have them originating from endothelial cells, from lymphocytes, uh, from nephrotic cells, uh, from, from all sorts of cells just being dumped into your plasma. Uh, whereas in the cell culture setting, you generally only have a clonal cell line that is spitting out exosomes. So it, it really is two different um, 
different environments, and one is just going to vastly outnumber the other in terms of concentration. Thank you so much. And Dr. McNamara, how do you elute the exosome if you're using if using um, an antibody coating bead? So we elute them with acidic glycine. Um, it's, it's been shown that exosomes are actually pretty resistant to, to low pH. And so we elute this just kind of based off of a typical immunoprecipitation method in which you incubate your immobilized exosomes on the antibody coated beads, you incubate them with acidic glycine. We add a little bit of a heat, uh, about 37 degrees, and then we do a, you know, a quick buffer exchange to neutralize the acid um, so that we're able to ensure that we're not having exosomes just permanently bathed in acid. And hopefully that, that makes sense. Thank you so much. And we have time for a couple more questions. Are you able to change the filter cutoff to isolate other subpopulations of EVs? I mean, that's, that's a really good question, and I can't say that we've really looked into that too much. Uh, we, we intentionally have a very high molecular weight cutoff filter so that we're only capturing things like exosomes, like microvesicles, like viruses. We, we use the same method to isolate viruses, by the way. Um, you know, other, other things like LDLs and, H, and, uh, and HDLs, particularly from plasma, uh, they seem to be able to bypass that filter as well. So we might even be able to use a, a higher cutoff filter if you wanted to really separate out your exosomes and your viruses from those other guys. Now, via tangential flow, is it possible to separate exosomes from microvesicles and viruses? Not really, because they're so similar as far as their diameter, as far as their molecular weights, that other subsequent steps need to be utilized to really obtain discrete populations. Thank you, Dr. McNamara. We're going to answer three more questions, and I just want to remind audience members that any questions not answered during our presentation will be answered via email. So don't worry, your questions will be answered. Have you thought about labeling the exomal RNA and CD81 for colocalization monitoring inside recipient cells? Have we thought about labeling um, the RNA, I'm sorry? The, the exosomal um, RNA and CD81 for colocalization monitoring inside recipient cells. Oh, oh boy. I like that question. Uh, and, <laughs> okay, so this is really looking at the endocytosis part of this. So um, if CD81 is trafficked out to the plasma membrane, as part of the multivesicular body to release exosomes, is it also trafficked to, kind of to the, to the uh, plasma membrane to receive exosomes? Uh, and that's kind of, I mean, that's, that's something that we, we haven't even been able to get into that, that one yet. And that's a really good question. And that's something that, again, the nanoimager is, is going to be really good for because you're going to be able to tease apart exosomes as opposed to, um, or I would say like endosome compartments as opposed to the lysosome, as opposed to the, um, uh, the autophagosome. Uh, those things are pretty differ difficult to differentiate based off of confocal microscopy and other conventional light microscopy methods uh, because you really want to be able to get subcompartmentalization of the endosomal recycling pathway. And that, I mean, that's a really good question. Uh, we, we, I personally have not done that. And that, that is a very ambitious thing to do. Thank you for that. And can exosomes transfer from plasma to colon, urine, bladder, or other parts of gastrointestinal system? So can the exosome transfer from the plasma to the colon uh, to other parts of the GI system? 
I mean, that is, uh, I, it's kind of, I, I guess it's kind of a difficult question to answer. So when, when things are in plasma, uh, the first cells, or the, the cells that they're going to see in plasma are going to be your lymphocyte population, uh, other circulating cells, as well as the endothelial cells, which line the vasculature. So I guess that the question is, is can the exosomes transverse that entire area or tran transverse the um, the endothelial cell and, and vein barrier and get into the colon and and, um, and some of those other cells? I don't know. I mean, if a cell is not somehow connected to the vasculature, an exosome might have a difficult time getting into it. Now, there's been some other models in, in virology, particularly uh, in the laboratory of Stephen Gould, in which he has proposed that uh, viruses like HIV can be uptaken, like an exosome, just go through the endosomal recycling pathway and exit that same cell. Uh, I don't know if that's ever been looked into for, for exosomes, but um, exosomes behave oftentimes very similar to viruses. So I, I do think that's a very good question and something to uh, something for the field to look forward or somewhere for the field to look into as we move forward. Thank you so much. And this is our final question today. And again, don't worry, your questions will be answered via email. What's your opinion if virus isolation from exosome is more beneficial than virus isolation directly from plasma or not? If virus isolation from exosomes is more beneficial than virus isolation directly from plasma. So I, I'm, I'm guessing, is it more beneficial to take things from, I guess, cell culture or from plasma? I, I guess that's, and, and particularly in the case of viruses and exosomes, um, well, I'm taking things from plasma in, in an in vivo system is always going to be as close to the the whole environment as you're as you're going to get. So when you're in a cell culture system, things are fairly artificial and fairly controlled. Um, taking it directly from plasma, um, it's a it's a much more in vivo system. Now that also complicates things because if you take exosomes or or viruses from plasma, you don't really know where they came from. Um, in, in viruses, it's a little bit easier to track because a uh, hepatitis virus is going to come from your liver. It's going to come from your hepatocytes. Um, exosomes taken from plasma is very difficult to backtrack where they came from. Uh, people are looking into that, and this goes back to a previous question about uh, the tetraspanins uh, being on the surface of exosomes and are they, are they ubiquitous. Some cells seem to have them enriched a little bit more than others. Um, and there's a whole bunch of other proteins incorporated into exosomes that seem to have similar traits. Um, you know, backtracking that is and that's very it's very difficult. So it, it, there's pros and cons, right? Because you, you have it in your in vivo system, taking it from plasma. You say, okay, this is a really good snapshot of what we have going around in circulation. Uh, but identifying where they came from and really where they're going is pretty tough. And in the cell culture system, you're saying, okay, if we have a culture of T cells, what kind of exosomes do they secrete? Can we say, okay, here is the, the, um, the marking of an exosome from a T cell. Is it unique enough from a separate culture that is of B cells? Can you really distinguish them? And that, and, and that question can only really be answered in cold populations of cultured cells, I think. But each one has their own pros and cons. I, I can't say I have a, a strong feeling on either because it really depends on the question that you're asking. Dr. McNamara, thank you so much for your time today and clearly your important research. I'd also like to thank LabRoots and our sponsor, ONI, for underwriting today's educational webcast. And before we go, I want to remind the audience, for thank you for joining us today and for your amazingly interesting questions. 
Again, just a reminder that questions we didn't have time for today and those submitted during the on-demand period will be addressed by the speaker via contact information you provided at the time of registration. This webcast can be viewed on demand and LabRoots will alert you via email when it's available for replay. And we encourage you to share this email with your colleagues who may have missed today's live event. That's all for now and we hope to see you again soon. Have a great day. Bye-bye.